Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Everybody have fun yesterday? Yeah. Great first day, right? Fantastic. Yeah, seriously. Woohoo! Hey, so um, my name's Matt, and uh, we are excited for day two of the U2 conference, and um, very excited for this session. And if I'm in the back embarrassing myself, just ignore me. A <laughs> um, couple uh, ho just housekeeping things. Um, if you are trying to get on the Wi-Fi again, remember the password. What is it? It's the, the it's Marriott Conf is the the one to use, and then the password is the U2. T H E U2 should work. Um, if you're on Twitter and doing that sort of stuff, uh, make sure to use the hashtag U2 Conf C O N F so that. Everybody else can follow along. Got a lot of tweets from people yesterday not here saying thanks for doing that so we can follow along with what's going on. Um, so we're going to get started. We have uh, um, an excellent session talking about what uh, U2's sound is and how it, uh, how it sounds like it sounds, I guess. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our At U2 staffers who is going to lead the session and uh, get things going. Please welcome Chris Endrenal. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm so excited to be here um, for day two of the second uh, YouTube conference. Um, just a little bit of background before we begin. Um, this session particularly hits home, hits very close to home for me. Um, I wrote my dissertation on U2's music, exploring their sound and their song construction. So hearing these guys talk about how they make this sound is going to go into my research. So thank you. Um, so I thought, I'd, uh, I thought we'd just get started by having the band members introduce themselves and um, letting you know uh, what part they play, and then we'll just we'll meet you in the sound. How about that? All right. Mick, take it away. Hello, my name is uh, Mick Norma from Springfield, Massachusetts, and I play guitar. Thank you. My name is Anthony Russo, Tony Russo, and I play Paul Hewson. <laughs> My name is George Lavasanos. Um, I'm the drummer. My name is Kirk Yell from Brooklyn. I'm the uh, first manager of the band, Aaron Clayton. <laughs> Second manager. I thought George was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So um, I thought I'd just get started. Uh, let's start at the top. Um, let's uh, dive right in with um, some of the uh, guitar effects. Um, I was wondering, since you have the... Uh, the black one plugged in. I was wondering about the infinite guitar and um, with or without you, that, that's arguably, well, not, not arguably, it is one of the most iconic sounds in rock and roll and popular music history. Uh, when, that, when, they, when Edge started to use that on a regular basis, it was, it was revolutionary, to be honest. Um, so how did, you, how did you manage to reproduce that sound and what do you do to, to, uh, to sustain that? Uh, well, we, we're going to decide, we're going to show you, we're going to build the song from, from the ground up, starting with uh, a loop that we have at back. We're going to basically do what U2 does. So we have a, a loop that we're going to play, then we're going to have the, the main run, uh, bass line run, and then I'll show you the infinite sustain. But uh, to answer your question, Edge uh, originally had, um, it was a prototype sustainer built for him. Um, I forgot the fellow's name. He used that, I think, on the early Joshua Tree. Then he, uh, Zoo TV, he changed over to what's called an Ebo, which is this handheld device that vibrates the strings and makes that uh, orchestral string sound. Uh, it's a very finicky piece of equipment. It works, sometimes it doesn't. So then he moved on to the Infinite Sustainer, which all it is is just a pickup and there's a battery in the back of the, of the guitar. So without it on, if you hit a note, it just it'll play and just ring out. When you turn it on, and it just it just keeps going. That's why they call it infinite sustain, so and that's all it is. And then you just there it is. So I mean it sounds kinda of naked by itself, but when we show you what we're gonna about to do now, we'll put it all together, then you can kinda you can see where it's coming from. And then I'm, just to add real quick, on top of that he adds what's called a shimmer, which is basically the guitar signal that you're hearing. And he, he puts an octave, I, I hope I'm not talking over your head, but he puts an octave on it, it's like a string sound, so it, it gives the sense of, of orchestra, like violin. So with it off, and then I can ease it in with this pedal, and you'll hear 
that high sound that you always hear. And that's it. So. So. <laughs> I, I could eat up this hour just myself. Nick feels really naked right now, really naked. <laughs> so anyway, so Joy is gonna is gonna play the loop, okay? Really, what it is, and we it's not we rip this off of you too, is, and and it, in so much as we actually well Nick recorded this, so so we actually play this loop. He recorded it, and then Joy is gonna play it. You'll see how it loops around, loops around. It can go on forever. The good thing about that is it's we're not being counted in, so I can come in anytime I want. I could add them to the crowd, I could shake hands, I could throw out t-shirts, and I can come at any time I want. That's the beauty of it. It's not like we're like, one, two, three, four. It's not like that. So go ahead. And Byron does the same thing, of course. <laughs> it's round and round. All day long. And it keeps going around and around and around. So, and you know, he ad libs. Everybody really ad libs. So it's, you know, it's we do the live version, and he's a genius at that. But that's the whole concept behind the, the whole loop thing. It's also and another example of Adam's uh, choice of notes because Mick is only playing one note. So I could have stayed on D. Adam could have just. But his note selection changed the whole song. And you'll see that in some of the other songs that we're going to example to you. I just want to add um, real quick. Um, as far as, as, far as La Larry goes, this is a very unique drum part that he's adding. And if you notice, he's got his... This, this is a floor plan here, right? Usually, he has two drums when he's playing a song. I couldn't bring both. So um, and it's very unique what he's doing. The average drummer usually does not... Um, playing his style. He plays with one hand and does the fills with the left hand as well. So it's a little bit different than your average drummer. So I think that's a very unique aspect of Larry's drumming. That's wonderful. Um, thank you. I, I, I'm probably not the only one who didn't want you guys to stop playing, but I realize, <laughs> I realize this is, uh, we don't have time for a full concert, sadly. But tonight, anyway. Um, and and uh, before we move on, um, we're going to pass out some index cards. So as, as the session is going along, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. So if you, have, if you think of a question um, for, for the band uh, while, we're, while they're talking about their sound, please just jot it down, we'll, uh, and we'll try to get to your question at the end. Okay. Um, so, Tony, um, reproducing Bono's vocals. I mean, he's, he's got such a wide range, uh, and, and he does so much. He sings well in falsetto, in his, in, in his high chest voice, middle chest voice. He's, he's even got a very good um, low voice. Uh, what's that like? I mean, uh, doing that night in, night out, at, or in the studio? You know, the funny thing is, like, everybody who's ever sang the national anthem it's one of the most hardest songs to sing because it goes so low and then it goes so high. And that's kind of like singing Bono because he has this great range of, of, of vocal that, that it's, it's almost um, irreproducible. And unless you're like really feeling it, there's, you know, it's like, how do I do this? You know, how, do I, how am I going to hit the note in bad? Oh, my God. It's, it's like almost unfathomable. So... Uh, it's, um, you know, one of my greatest challenges as a singer to try it the best of my ability to reproduce that sound. But he does have this incredible range. Um, and if we could just do a quick example of the kind of effects he does. Like, you know, we're talking now in the microphone. It's very dry. And uh, if I can give the best example. And then in the concert, 
this is really what you're hearing, is something like this. Hey! Two! 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 He's got this, he's got this, he's got this echo. 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 And it rings on and on. on, and on. A little bit louder. A little bit louder. A bit louder. Get the effect. Get the effect. So if he's so singing, if something, singing something, singing something, you know, like a, you know, like a, you know, like a, you know, uh, you know, see the stars in your eyes, see the falling twist in your side. Are we, are we, for you, for you? So it's that whole it's echo that thing. Echo thing. Echo thing. You don't really hear it in concert, in concert, but it's always but there. It's always present. Always present. Always present. So there's an echo not just on the edge, but also on, on the lead vocal. So top end is, uh, is, loves the echo. So um, guys in the bottom end, the the engine room, perhaps. Um, of course, uh, Bono and, uh, and and Edge get a lot of the, get get a lot of the spotlight. Um, from many interviews and even from concert footage, it's it's very clear that Adam and Larry themselves have a very tight connection. Um, how do you guys maintain that connection? Um, I mean, they're, they're, they 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 operate so tightly. Um, how does that work for you guys on stage? Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, actually, George and I are very close, just by chance, and uh, it, it helps, I guess, with our connection with the music. <clears throat> from the first time we talked to him, we were close so but as far as the, the low end I think that uh, Adam holds the foundation down in the band I don't think it would be quite the same if he moved around anymore but then again his movement and choice of notes is sets the tension in the music and also I think George will explain a little bit more about some of the marching beats and the uh, unorthodox way that he approaches the drums I think it helps with the it, it just makes the whole band feel like an orchestra everybody has their piece in the in the spectrum of the sun. So, George, can, can you elaborate a little bit more about, about um, Larry's unique style? He, he did start off as, as a marching band drummer. Can you talk a little bit that's about that? That's his background. So, um, he played in, mar in marching bands, and so the snare drum um, is very prevalent in most of the two songs, um, which is very unique. Um, most drummers, and actually, I think Mick had said it's as if his high hat doesn't exist, which in most rock bands, this is the main, the high end of the snare are the, are the main two um, you know, drums that, that are being hit. But the snare drum, almost in every song, whether it's bad or streets, um, or the month, is you, mo most of the songs have that marching feel. And even like a song like Sunday, Bloody Sunday, that's that march that's happening there. Da, 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 da. So that's what he's doing there. So, um, I think on stage, so we're holding that, that bottom end and we're locking in. So I think while, while um, the edge and Bono are doing their thing, we're holding, we're locking down that bottom end and that, you know, yeah. foundation. So we need to be locked in. So we're working closely together to make sure we, we, we have that going on. Could you perhaps demonstrate a couple of, um, a couple of, the, of, of, his, of, of his drum lines where, where the snare is a lot more prevalent than the, than the hi-hat? I hat. And I want to see if anybody knows where, what song it's from. I think everybody should know. Name, <laughs> name that tune, everybody. Yeah. Name that tune. Exactly. So, give me, give me the second place on the beat. I want to talk about Pride for a second. So, so Pride, I think, was originally, uh, the difference between that film and what most drummers would do is those accents that you're hearing, and at any point, you know exactly what song you heard that. When I heard that film, that, that's a legendary film, and that was late in the 80s when I heard that I, I, I needed to know how to do that. So, um, that's unique. I'm, I'm going to try that, that on Sunday, Buddy Sunday, and see if you guys see what he's doing there. I can't help it, Todd. <laughs> I can't help it either. <laughs> That's great. I, I mean, so in, in that Sunday Bloody Sunday, um, it's not only an emphasis on, on the snare, but it's also a lot of syncopation. And for, for, for the non-musicians in here, syncopation is an emphasis on an offbeat. So it's, so it's an accent where you don't expect an accent. And I know that Larry does that a lot. Does that make it hard to play his stuff? I, I love 
syncopation stuff, so I grew up playing that stuff and learning that stuff. So for me, it, it makes so much sense. And I think for a lot of other drummers, again, his, his drumming is not very technical or complicated, um, but his approach is very different in how he plays it in the songs, where most drummers don't approach the drum set in that fashion. Did you take drum lessons as? I did, actually, yeah. OK, because in, in, in an interview I, I read, um, one of the producers of one of their albums, uh, Flood, actually said that um, Larry's style is basically wrong, because he's, he's self-taught, which, which his quote-unquote wrong technique makes him sound unique. So as, as someone who took, took lessons, do you find it, does it feel wrong? I grew into it, just listening to it and watching what, what he was doing. Um, his, his drumming, I think, is, I, I think he's an instinctive type of player. Mm. He wants instinctive. to, you know, he, I think he approaches the song how he feels, right. um, and that's what it is. It, it, that's what makes him unique. So for me, I just think it's an interesting um, way of approaching the song, the way he does it. kind of makes sense to me. So for me, it, it, it made total sense. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's why you, you two, for me, is my opinion, but separates from any other band. I mean, the, the questions you just asked, where he's playing, he, he mentioned it, it's like they're like an orchestra. Yeah. They sound so huge, so big on stage, because he's playing such an unorthodox style beat in his own world. He's playing a bass line, creating the root of the song. Where Edge, Edge you know, most bands today, if, he's, if, if the bass player's playing a G, the guitar player's playing the G. If he's playing an A, guitar's player playing an A. And it's just bar chords, and it just kind of just narrows it down. The way U2 does it, it's very orchestral. They're, he's playing completely different from what I'm playing. He's playing something off the wall, weird timing, a accents. <laughs> and then Edge doesn't even play chords. He's playing a little high notes, 11 o'clock TikTok, something like that. You know, high no you put it all together, and it gives this huge, expansive sound for four guys. So, anyway. So, um, I want to come back to that to that four guys in 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 just a second. But uh, Craig, to get to something in something in the low end, uh, we had a paper session yesterday, or we we had a paper on a session yesterday that talked about um, Adam's bass lines and how it's pretty minimalist in in its aesthetic. Um, it's relatively simple yet completely integral to the band and its sound. Um, do you find it? Even though it's simple, do you, do you still find it challenging to play relatively simple lines like 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 the bass line in With or Without You? It's four notes. It's four notes on a stream of eighth notes. So rhythmically, it's not very challenging. Harmonically, it's not very challenging. But what challenges do you find in, in trying to reproduce Adam's signature? Well, uh, a song like With or Without You, the intensity of the bass uh, builds up with the tune. Um, again, the note selection is so important. I mean, you take a song like New Year's Day, which is A C to E. So New Year's Day without that bass part would be. Now you let his his uh, influences in there, and you got. So you, you see how that's a charm. <laughs> I mean, you take a song like even uh, the streets. This is a good example for all of us, where George can join us with his marching beat, and uh, the the um, Mick or the Edge would just play the same thing over and over. Can you play that for me? Can you play streets? Uh, the first part. Sounds kind of boring by itself. So this is what the verse sounds like. So he's not changing. So now... That's a great example. He didn't do anything different. Right. So Adam, Adam changed the whole song. You do the same thing over and over. I, I play the same thing over and over and over again, and he dictates the the whole song. Is is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, just as a fair warning, if you start that song again, I'm not gonna make you stop. You have to. You, you have to finish it. Um, uh, going back to to the shimmer. Uh, so, 
a lot of times it's, you know, um, Adam's driving it with, with his harmonic changes. Again, it's another unorthodox player. He didn't take lessons. As a matter of fact, when he joined the band, he didn't know how to play. He just looked cool. <laughs> and what I meant earlier about the manager, he was actually the first manager of you 2 not, not this band, but... Um, so he looked cool, and I didn't realize until I amplified him that he was hanging around notes. They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> you don't know how to play at all. I mean, you're cool looking. You smoke cigarettes, you hang out, you got fur jackets, and... But uh, as you can see, he's still kind of playing. He had an afro. He had an afro. He did have an afro. Well, that's it. He did have an afro. <laughs> he tried to be Phil Lynott at the time. Uh, Mick, um, going back to uh, that shimmer that uh, kind of started to come through on, on uh, New Year's Day. Um, how often do you use um, that effect? And, and or, or make it a little more general question. What, what, what effects do are, are used the most in his rep? Uh, well, I'll get to the shimmer in a minute. The most important effect is the delay. You know, and, and there's certain different types of delay. He uses what's called a modulated delay, which uh, makes the each repeat, it's an echo, basically. The echo of the guitar, um, it kind of choruses it a little bit, and it, it just widens the sound. And, um, well, I can just show you. Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, like a sound like bad. Now, bad is, uh, you know, you hear it and it's like, wow, I've never heard anything like that in my life. But it's actually, it's like three or four notes. So I'm going to play the riff without any delay, and then I'll turn the delay on and you can hear the difference. So, I mean, it's, it sounds like a little child playing. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw the clip of him doing the elevation intro. It's exactly like that. Mike I'll, I'll show you that, too. But, but uh, delay, without delay, bad would sound like this. That's it. And then if you turn the delay on. Uh, well, it's, it's a whole new ball game, you know? Wow. That's all just from the record. You're a genius. You're a genius. <laughs> How did you come up with that? <laughs> And Mick, I didn't. Could you could you show us the the elevation? So for for those, yeah. um, the, 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 there's a clip online uh, about the edge, um, and how it's on the movie It Might Get Loud. Right. He does this. So he uh, so he so he demonstrates just how how simple it is that what he's playing, and that the effect uh, gives it the signature sound. Yeah, I don't know if you caught that. Um, there's a YouTube clip where he he actually shows that, and uh, but again, it's uh, all it is is two chords. This is without. This is called a K-fuzz tone. That's the exact effect that he uses, and that's, that's what's here. They're pretty rare. But uh, without the K-fuzz tone, the, the riff would sound like this. Oops. That's it. <laughs> Turn the pedal on. <laughs> There you go, and that's it. That's the whole sound. Wow. wow. It's all trickery. Smoke and mirrors. The hardest part is figuring it out. Once you figure it out, you know. Right. Um, so, uh, how did you figure it out? Uh, how, how did you? How did you get one of those rare? Because I'm exactly like everybody in here. I'm a YouTube freak, and I just, <laughs> and I just, uh, I basically worship the edge. I don't know. I mean. I mean, I'm a fan, we, 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 again, I mean, we're just, all we are are copycats. We're, you know, we love the music, we're fans first and foremost. I mean, I just want to make that clear. We're not, this is a hobby for us. We all have regular jobs, we just have fun with it. So, but yeah, I just, uh, I collect gear, I collect guitars, all, this, all the stuff he uses is all vintage. Uh, it's very hard to find. Um, so I try to collect it over the years. And uh, hopefully the wife does, you know, it's, uh, keeps me in check. Um, how many how many songs per show are more than just you four? Like in terms of effects or or other layers that 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 you loop or backing loops, backing tracks. I would say it's bad. I would well he backtrack. Um, I would say maybe a quarter of the songs are backtrack, and three quarters are just four guys playing live. I mean, what I mean by that is. Well, you have to have a backtrack for 
you know, certain songs like Beautiful Day and Mysterious Ways, um, Bad, you know, stuck in the moment. So there's little things in the background that happen, like Mick plays a live keyboard on stage, but sometimes when he's not playing keyboard, there's a little bit of keyboard in the background, faintly. There might be some strings. So maybe 25% of the songs are on, on some kind of backing where Mick actually created it, but we play it live. You know, that started the Unforgettable Fire Tour, by the way. Um, bad, those, those songs necessitate that backing loops and back track. From that point on, they, that's when they started into back track. The early days, like, you know, Out of Control, I Will File, those are just four guys on stage, so. Right. Um, something for, for Larry over here, George. Uh, um, would you say that Larry's parts are um, almost melodically conceived? So not just rhythmic, but also that, 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 that there's a sense of melody to his, to his drumming. Uh, we, I, I guess most of us don't often think of drums and percussion as having, having a melodic component to them, but do, do, do you hear anything Absolutely. more than rhythm? I think um, his drumming, again, is, he plays by instinct. I think he plays by feel and um, follows Bono a lot. So I think he's, as the vocals are happening, his drumming is kind of revolves around the vocals, so I think he's following exactly what, what's happening up there. So yeah, they are definitely melodic in that aspect, yes. Fantastic. Um, another question here. Uh, you two often receive criticism for a lack of musical talent. Um, in each of your four opinions, uh, are you two talented or proficient musicians? Why or why not? Well, as far as Larry goes, he, again, he's not technical. He's not, um, you know, Neil Peart. He's, he, he's not that style of drummer. Um, but again, his approach is very unique. And actually, I had a friend of mine who's a drummer um, come up to me. And he's in a cover band. He also plays U2 once in a while. He, he came up to me and he says, I just don't get it. I don't get him. So, so that's, that's the reaction that you get from, I think, most drummers. In, in the rock scene. So um, again, his, it's his approach is very unique, not so technical, but very unique. So. I mean, my, my opinion is, I mean, what, what is music? I mean, if you enjoy it, is it really a contest? Who is the best? Who's not the best? I mean, The Edge to me is a pioneer. He's a pioneer in the sound that he's created. He, he is number one. He's, the sound that he makes is him. You know, so to me, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how fast you are or how, you know, you can be all uh, versed in music theory and that's great, but you throw that in the basket and you go see a U2 concert and that's, are you thinking, oh, now let's see, did he, did he play a minor third there? Or, you know, you, you don't talk like that. You just go to have a good time. And that's why they're the greatest band in the world, period. I mean, that's the way I see it. Yeah. For me, it's like, uh, I think Bono is a great songwriter, lyr lyrical-wise, lyrically. So, to me, he's, he's separated from the pack in that he can come up with these great lyrics. And he reads the Bible a lot, let's, let's face it. A lot, of the so, a lot of the songs come from the Bible, if you hadn't read the Bible. Um, but, you know, to me, it's, that's what separates him. He's not the greatest singer in the world. He's not my favorite singer. But lyrically, he's, he's on another world, you know. I think the, the songs are the vehicle and the band develop through the songs and through playing with each other. So, do they... Like Nick said, it's not a competition. It's a, there's great songs. That's the most important thing. That I think the parts are the v are complement the song. I don't think anybody plays anything. It's like wow, look at that lick. But then it wouldn't be a great song. So I think and the, and the fact that the bass is so low and so warm, it really the edge couldn't do what he's doing without Adam. In other words, you couldn't have getting Lee in the band or somebody like you know Stanley Clark or somebody really making a lot of notes and stuff like that. It would have to be the foundation here. Is there a particular song where um, the bass, where, where you and, and Mick are, are particularly um, interactive? Like Probably like, well, we're and, and, different. And, and, and can you demo that for us? Like City of Blinding Lights, he, again, he's playing one note, and he, he's the song. It, without, without Adam or, or Larry, if it was just Edge, that's one particular song. I don't think you would know what song I'm playing, because yeah, yeah. he, he's basically, you want me to let me do a little intro yeah. and then go into that thing. Yeah, do that. Do, do that. Yeah, do the orchestra. He, uh, no objections here. Yeah. Well, try and tie everything back in. Going back to that shimmer thing, yeah. right on the was it the vertigo or uh, 
when City came out, uh, that's another thing they do. You, what you hear on the album, then you, you, you see them live. They take their own songs and they rewrite them. So, um, so the. Uh, the Sitting down, so it's hard. And then he's like, oh wow. So then he turns it off, and then he just plays one note. And that's it. And then the backing track comes on, and then Craig carries the song. Is, it, is that the same with the verse? Can we just do the verse the for a second? Verse. Whole verse is one note. the movement of the bass, what song are you playing? I would just yeah. play. So there it's the, it's again, would, it's that. I would just be playing that, one note. So Mick and, and the Edge have, have their effects units, so a lot of his sound is, is dictated by, you know, processing and things. But I noticed um, when you changed slightly your, the, your hand position on, on, on the fret, the timbre of, of the bass changed a little bit. It, 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 it was, it was a, the, the sound was a little shorter. Can you talk a little bit that, about that, that's how... That's interesting. I've, I didn't forget to mention it. He, he would play on one string. He loves to play up here. In other words, you could play the same note as they appear. Or, but when he plays it up here, you'll see him all the time. He's always up here. It's much different than... It's a different sound completely. And, and can, you, can you just explain for, for the non-musicians uh, in here what, what, what that does? Like playing higher on, playing higher on the neck, it, it decreases the, the string length. So the vibration is different, which means that it's a different sound. Yes, it's a, it's a lot deeper, as you can hear. And that, again, it fills up that low end that the band really it just, that's their sound. Again, he plays around with octaves. I mean, he'll play, uh, instead of playing this D, he'll play it up here. Like in the beginning of uh, Electrico. He, he's up there. It just fills up such a low end, you know. So, yeah, that's... He'll play on one or two strings for a long time. <laughs> I never felt so. I never felt so insignificant with you guys. <laughs> what am I doing up here? <laughs> yeah, can I sit down there? <laughs> Chris, I, I, I think wait till it. tonight. I'm gonna get you later, man. <laughs> yeah. Um. So as as performing as performing performing musicians, what do you hear or notice when you're playing live that non-musician fans may not hear or notice? Say it again. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there are elements of the band's sound that you guys try to reproduce when you're, when you're playing live that may not be as evident or as overt. This is my question. Yeah. Maybe harmonics? This, no, th th this was my question. When you're at a U2 concert, do you think you hear things differently than, say, I do because I don't? play the music? Do you hear all the mistakes? Are there a lot of mistakes? Yes. Do you hear when, <laughs> do you, like, do you hear when Bono's not hitting a note all right, or oh, when yes. he changes, like, you, like, at, like after a U2 concert, and you're talking to non-musicians, are you on I'm focus on different things, I guess, than, than other people are, and look, they sound great every time they play, but I might be focused on, like, how he's singing a certain song, is he going to hit that note, or is he going to, where is he going to take this, is he going to hit the high one, or is he going to go back low? I'm looking at the edge thinking like, you know, how's it gonna take, where's it gonna take the song, you know? I'm thinking, is it going this way or that way? So, I, you're right, Matt, I think it's 
for us, it might be a different experience because we, you know, we do this. So we're like really honed in on those little things. I honestly, I try not to. I, I when I go to YouTube concert, I want to just enjoy myself, but I can't help it. You know, I, I bring the you know, I don't bring the notepad. But I'm just saying. But the last oh, tour, the last tour was hard because Dallas and you know he took his whole rig and he's below the stage. I don't know if you noticed that the 360s. So. He didn't control a lot of the stuff that he used to control himself. Dallas would be controlling it for him. So, like, I'm controlling everything I do here, and that's what Edge used to do. But now he's, you know, walks around the, the heart and all that, and a lot of the changes are made by Dallas. So it's, it's harder to pick up. But, yeah, I, I would sit there. If I see him make a change, I know what effect he's calling for, and then I see how he's going about it. I watch where his hands are. Like Craig said, you can play the same thing, different parts of the neck. So I watch where he plays it, and then... And then I try it myself, so. Rick, what item that Edge has that adds so much to his sound, so distinctive? That's a, good, that's a great question. If out of all, everything that Edge has used, which is a refrigerator of rack and uh, multiple M5, 6 amps, the, the greatest thing he uses is this pick. And it, it sounds crazy, but this is, is a Hurdum pick. It's made in Germany. This is exactly the pick that Edge uses. And he's, you look at it, and you're like, oh, it's just a guitar pick. Big deal. But the, what it is, I, it's, I, mean, I just explain. It just has uh, this rough uh, uh, like hand grip on it. And you're supposed to use it for your grip. But what Edge does is he turns it upside down, and he uses the, that scraping grip. That gives him that signature sound. I'll show you what I mean. So if he was a place they still haven't found it looking for, OK? And if you were going to play it with a regular pick that you buy on a guitar store, it would sound like this. It still sounds good. But if you turn the pick upside down, it gives that percussion, scrapey sound. It's hard to explain, but it's, it's signature edge. It'd be like this. Sorry. You can hear like a like a ching, ching, a ching, that ching, and that's it's all in this pick, and uh, wow. that's the other harmonics as well. So you know, he always plays harmonics with no a normal pick would sound like this. That sounds okay with with the pick. It sounds like this. Wow. It's small, not that significant, but it make, to me it's it's huge. So. Uh, actually, let's, let's, let's keep going with that. What, what, for, for the other three, what are some of the subtleties that um, you guys do to help um, replicate more authentically the sound? Like, I mean, the pick is something that probably 99.999% of people didn't know. Um, anything, is, is, is there anything that Bono does or anything that, that, that you do that um, helps you replicate? Well, it's funny. If you ever like, read some of the early books, or if you ever uh, hear Bono talking about his early days, um, he, he never goes back and listens to his old stuff. Like, he, he'll never go back to boy because he says, I sound like a girl. And it's true. If you listen to the album, he sounds like a girl. If you put on boy, if you put on out of control, and then you put on something from, you know, no line, it's a whole, it's a different guy. So you have to... In, in, my, in my shoes, what you have to do is you have to take that world and go back to that world and try to sound like a girl <laughs> for the most part. But you, and that's the challenge is because you're, you're, you're trying to like, you know, emulate this guy from 1980 and then you're trying to emulate this guy from, you know, 2011. It's a challenge. So and, and what I try to do is I try to think, okay, how would he have done this in 1980 in Boston and the, at the, uh, you know, Paradise Theater, <laughs> you know, 11 o'clock TikTok. So I, I try to put myself back there. So yeah, it, the challenge for me is trying to sound like that younger voice and then trying to sound like the older voice, you know. George, about, about the drums? Yeah, I think, um, again, he's very snare drum focused. He uses a lot of these things called ghost notes on his stuff, um, they're very subtle hits. Um, and you can really hear it on something like One Tree Hill. Um, and he uses it in, in, in a lot of different songs. Um, I, could, I could do a quick example. Please, so you please. See what they are. <laughs> so, 
ghost note is something that's really very soft. Something like like one three Hill. He's doing something like this. Where if if you're another drummer, right? It wasn't Larry. Would approach that song. The other would probably just go. that same marching, you know, military type of thing that, that he's doing. So he's, so, he's, so he's constantly filling his own, his own drum line, exactly. essentially. He's, and I'm not sure if everybody picks that up. You know, I think people watch Larry and, and, and other drummers are also checking him out, and I think they're not really getting what he's doing. So if you study him, you'll, you'll come out with it as he's doing a lot more than what, you know, you think he's doing. Um, with these little subtleties. So that's my, a lot of, that's the challenge, is really getting little, little subtle things going on in the snare. Um, yeah. That's good. Wow. Craig, some, some subtleties about it? Well, Adam's influence is a reggae in Motown, as that's what is listed. So you can tell by his sound, and, and I think that uh, the deepness of his bass, I think, uh, is the one thing that works for him. I think sometimes he plays it safe, and some of the versions that we do, we may go back to a live version from 83 in Boston or something, and he might have taken a little bit more liberty on the bass. But at the same time, the, the fact that the lines are so solid, you, you know, you, you might want to take liberties where you shouldn't, and really, everyone's counting on that bass to be there on those notes, to, be, to hold on the foundation. He also uses effects, and like uh, The Edge has somebody else doing it off stage now. But at one time, he did have uh, a few pedals, which I have. So the chorus pedal and an envelope filter, and uh, I think Boots had some distortion on it. He tried that, yeah. and he's tried a few different effects here and there. And the keyboard for City Down Lights, which we used to bring out. But I think his sound has, and his instrument choice, has developed into a really rich bass sound. I mean, he uses Fender basses most of the time when he records, and I think generally that tracks really deep. He used to use an Ibanez bass, which I think doesn't have the, the same depth. Yeah. So you talked a, a little bit about how Adam's sound has Adam's sound and, and play style has 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 matured. Do the three other band members do you notice um, vast differences in let's say playing something off Boy, and then if you play something from let's say Atomic Bomb or No Line, are there are there big differences in 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 how their style has has uh, has grown or, or the really timing is one thing. Yeah, I mean, Bob will talk to you about that. The timing was it was just cinematic. It overplayed a little bit here and there. And, and uh, Larry's ma matured yeah. as, as far as his drumming. Um, I think he used to play a million miles an hour when we first started, and his timing um, start off with a tempo like this and end with you know at the end of it. So he's really come a long way in an hour aspect, and I think the backing tracks have helped a lot. Um, and his drumming, I think he's, he's also simplified a lot of his stuff. Um, again, uh, some of the new stuff, I'm not sure if it's due, I mean, he's got tendonitis as well, and his back problem, so his style has changed also because of his injuries. So I think a lot of the stuff that he does is also tailored, you know, um, I mean, if, if he's creating a, a new album, I think he's also focusing in on, um, wait a minute, I could do something really complicated here, but I'm going to have to do it every single night. So I, 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 I think when he's, when he's coming up with his parts, that, that's a big deal. Well, you l listen to some of the other stuff, like Out of Control. I mean, he's all over the drum set. I will follow. He's doing a lot of stuff there where he's, and I think simple is better anyway, um, but he's matured in that respect big time, I think. For me, Edge, Edge in the early days used with uh, Electro Harmonics Memory Man delay, which maxes out at a certain milliseconds. And like Craig said, the delay is a time-based effect. It had, the echoes are on a time. So that's why U2 uses click tracks. He, Larry will hear a click, so he stays in time. In the early days, they never did that. You know, the tempo is all over the place. They pretty much would play fast songs. As, as he got newer delays, which are longer, long, longer times on them, they create more slower songs, um, you know, like All I Want Is You, stuff like that. Um, those are slower delays, which you could, they could never do in the early days because the delays back then were, were quick. They, they, they didn't have the depth that they have today. So that's how it's changed. 
I, it's Nick, we were saying the, the delays are in time with the song. I think we should tell you. Yeah, right? Uh, That's why the click, you see George wears, he's got headphones on. Got, yeah, like the early days, the tempo was all over the place. Today, even the early songs that they play today, they play to a click track. They never used to do that. Uh, I Will Follow, they're all, everything is on a click track. So they, if you, you, you could record, say, electric car, a bootleg, at the beginning of a, of a tour, go to the same tour at the end of the tour, record it again, and you could sync them up with a computer, and they'll line right up. It, the, the timing is, is exact. Um, Sometimes I go off that click, I get 30 looks off you know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but did you, ever, did you ever get one of those, like, monitor cuts from the shows? Have you, like the bootlegs? And you can hear the guy you going, you can hear it. Two, one, two, three, the heart is a boom. No. <laughs> so it's like, they're, they're like, like, like Nick said, it's like, it's like metronome. And we don't have that luxury of, I th when, I, when, when they're on stage and they go off the click, there's, they, they have folks back there who are putting them back on that click. When yes. I go off the click, it's over. We're in trouble. I mean, <laughs> like, off, 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 step back, of Bonnie, just one more verse. You, you, you say the wrong words. <laughs> He's hearing all that stuff in his ear. He's hearing everything. Well, and Nick has to yell, you know, yell to tell him, Tony, it's the second verse! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, that, you know, if you have seen you two mess up on stage, usually it's not minor. It, it's pretty major. And that's because they've become so accustomed to, to these click tracks, and it's, they don't think about it. So when things do go wrong, which happens, it, it can be, it could be a catastrophe. I mean, people end up clapping anyways, but, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, when we, when we have that catastrophe, it's not good. Bono at times will play the guitar, uh, so how does that affect the sound? And other than him being the front man, <laughs> why doesn't he play more? Good question, Chris. <laughs> I do own two Irish Falcons, by the way. No. You know, he, he was never a guitar player, and I'm a drummer at heart. It's my first instrument was a drummer. So w when I joined this band, I'm like, oh, I, I, should, I gotta start playing guitar. And then I started watching Bono, and he, you know, he's, he's, he's pretty decent, he is. You know, so I, he plays very simple things. So what I say to the guys is, I say people in the audience, whatever he plays, I'll play. I'm not going to do anything more or less. Yeah, he plays open chords, he plays bar chords, great. You know, and I, I try. <laughs> he plays about four chords. But still, it's, but still, it, what it does for us is, and to answer your question, Chris, is that it, it makes the aesthetic look good. Am I a good guitar player? No. Uh, but every once in a while, I'll pick up the guitar. I'd rather not, because I'm more focused on, you know, the audience. But, um, y you know, I, I think he's a good guitar player, frankly. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see, one for uh, Craig here. Adam took lessons in the mid-90s. Yes, so how did, how did his sound or playing uh, change after that? Did, did you notice anything, either subtle or, or overt, that, that changed from, let's say, the early half? Again, it matured again. It, it, it consolidated his parts. He wasn't all over the place. The early stuff was... Uh, erratic at times, other than some great moments like New Year's Day and stuff like that. Actually, I, I know the instructor, I think he took him to New York City, from what I remember, right? Yeah. He did. Yes. I, uh, I remember being at a music store hearing about that. Again, I think, it, I think he was having trouble just nailing down the parts night after night. And uh, I think the lessons kind of put that together. Did he get technically better? No. He still, again, it's those note, note selections that are instinctively in you. You either know where to go or you don't. And whatever notes he chooses, I feel like it works for the band and it makes sense. You know, kind of like James Jameson from the Motown era, the note selection is, is the whole key, you know. We have a question uh, about a specific song here. Uh, in your opinion, why, did, why does you 2 struggle so much at playing Staring at the Sun in concert? Is that song particularly tough? Yeah. Not really. I mean, uh, they, well, they, I think they've only tried it live as a band only a couple times. Acoustically. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of times they, if it doesn't work with the band and, and they feel that a need to play it, they'll, they'll go acoustic with it. Um, but uh, I've heard, I think I have a bootleg at home where they did it. Whole, I don't know if it was a sound check or whatever, but yeah, it, was, it wasn't too good. I don't know. A lot of times I, I think it sounds good. They don't think it sounds good, so they don't play it full band. Plus it's Edge and Dino harmonizing, which they don't do 
seeing face to face very, very often. Uh, kind, of, kind of building off that, um, off that last question, um, for each of you, what's, what's the hardest song to, to play for, f for you it, as, as, as individuals? So Mick, what's, what's, the, what's the hardest song that, that Edge plays? Tony, what's, what's the hardest song Bono sings? Well, I don't know about hard. Is it, it, to me, it's either you can play it or you, you can't play it. Um, I, but I, I would suppose I would say Wire, only because it's a, a fast, very fast. Well, go ahead and play tempo. that for a second. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Give me a clip. That's problem, I can't. Because we never do this. <laughs> I want to hear him do it. You know, the hard part is the, uh, you know, that beginning. Uh, it's so fast. And again, back in those days, there's, they didn't really use clicks. And... You know, you, I could hear them go off, but and you had to go around the horn to catch it on tempo again. But to me, that's the hardest song. It's it's fast. Uh, there's a lot of you know, you got to be on on tempo, and it goes off quite easily. So it, it's t t as a band, it's hard. Tony, what's the hardest song for for you to sing? The note in bad is probably the highest note I'll ever hit in this band. Um, you either hit it or you don't hit it. Um, 50% of the time, I don't hit it. <laughs> and I'm being conservative. So, you know, when that, when that part of the song comes up, and I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm just like, I'm looking at Mick, and Mick's looking at me going. <laughs> and when I do hit it, Mick will go. And when I don't hit it, Mick will go. <laughs> so that's... The most stressful night, <laughs> part of the night for me is that one note, because it's such a high note. It's the highest note he sings, really, in any, any song. Everything else is okay. It's that one note. George Ford? As far as hard goes, I, I want to say hard, but if we're talking about what song makes me sweat, sure, I would say it would be uh, what, Streets. Um, definitely that would be, I mean, that, that's a fast-moving song, and the fact that he's... Um, He's actually using a tim timbali in that song. What rock drummer uses a tim That's a Latin hey. drum, right? Hey, all right. Hey, hey over there. I mean, half the, song, the half the song is a timbali. I don't, I'm not even sure where he came up with that. But um, it's a fast driving song. So I don't have a timbali. What I do is I, I use my um, snare drum here and I take the snares off and I tune it really high and I get, you know, the tim timbali feel, sound. So, but that song, and then half of it is with, with the snare. So I would say that one makes me sweat. But as far as it's not that difficult, it's just, you know, fast driving song. Okay. Craig, what do you sweat? Again, I think it's just finding the space in the song that makes it, the, you know, that I feel is the most complicated part. I don't think there's anything that's really, I mean, two hearts is a pretty nice space part. I don't think there's any part of the song, or a U2 song that I find that I'm like, holy cow, am I going to get it tonight? It's more the feel. And finding that pocket between the drums and the guitar. I think that's where I find... Uh, Tony Bono plays a lot of harmonics. Are you also proficient with harmonics? Good question. <laughs> well, you got to go like that. I have to. Yeah. This is the only instrument I have, so I'm going to do this. <laughs> so one of my favorite songs, he, they play on a flat tuning, so it's really hard to find flat harmonicas. So for instance, when the stand still is in D, but it's D flat, so you have to find a D flat harmonica. Desire is an A, but well, good luck finding an A flat harmonica. You can't buy it in the store, you have to special order it. And then Trip Through Your Wires is in D, but I was born. 
So three different harps, okay? So you need to realize, he's not just playing one harmonica. He's got three different and different tunes, okay? And these are cheap. So if you want to see Bono throw it out to the audience, I'm going to get 25 bucks. You know, he's like, yeah, here you go. Right. Yeah, just... Oh, you have one. Do a little bit of desire. That's, a, that's another example of the drums, you know, the, the tribal, you know, snow game things. I think what, what, he, what George was saying about the syncopation, which I don't know was, it's like, it's almost like what he leaves out. It's the space that normally would have been filled with 16th notes, but he leaves stuff out so it has that syncopated feel. And uh, also what the, Tony was talking about the tuning, the, that's why the, the, they switch so much instruments during the, during the gig. This, this bass is not tuned to 440. We can't, I can't play to a standard piano, either can Nick. This is tuned down a half step. The bass over there is E flat. flat. E flat. Yeah, right. this, is tu this is tuned down, maybe for the vocals, for probably all practical reasons. And then that's a standard bass, and Nicky has standard guitars, and we, we switch back and forth all through the gig. We, it, that's how they do it. So we do it the same, and, and tonally, it's, it's a different sound. Um. I know as, as, a, as a U2 fan, particularly if I see a show in the GA, it's an exhausting experience. It's, it's rewarding, but it's exhausting. How do you guys deal with issues of endurance? I mean, playing their music has got to be, I mean, it, it makes you sweat regardless of what song you're playing. So how do you guys Talk deal with that end. when you're on stage? Talk about the end. Oh, we Reconstructive knee surgery, <laughs> torn Achilles tendon, wow. torn meniscus. I mean, we're old men. <laughs> It's funny, Chris. That's a really good question because we're, we're I'm perfectly fine. We're <laughs> 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 He's got three kids. It's you know what? After a Saturday gig, I I, I can't go to work on Monday. I'm I'm limping. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, we we played it was in Long Island somewhere at the end. So we played. I think it was over three hours. Just one set. We just kept going, and um, yeah, we paid the price in the morning. But that's know. but that's the great thing about you too. Is like. How does this guy do it, man? How does he do it? I, I am in awe of that. I am in utter awe of that. That he could get up there night after night, pound it out and sing it and, and run around. When he ran around that heart during the Elevation Tour and he splat on a stream. <laughs> that was like, that was brilliant. But God, how great is he that he can do that? Yeah. Uh, the longevity of the band. Uh, do you guys like playing anything from the pop record? Because a lot of us have noticed that um, that record in particular has been kind of left off the set list live. So, please and disco. Sorry, please and disco. We like doing. Um, we've done disco tech a number of times. Um, every once in a while, we'll do a, we'll throw please into Sunday Morning Sunday because if you know at the end, just do it real quick. Just real quick. <laughs> He'll do like uh He'll do like He'll do like 
September, she's got sizes, spin over, and down the train, shards of glass, sphinx is not a but she can only be so don't let any sudden play son and we'll throw that in there. You know, and we might we might do the whole please, please. So the th you know the thing is there's a lot of songs it, uh, this is my opinion and I hope I don't offend anybody, but like off the new what no line, I'm not really a fan of, of much of that album and I sense that a lot of people aren't. Um, a lot of songs we wanna play them and we and we, we do, you know, we'll play what they're playing, but a lot of times for us, for our band, it doesn't connect, you know, it doesn't show and same with pop. There's a lot of those songs. I, I love all you two songs, but some just don't, they don't work live, and uh, we don't really get a good reception when we play certain songs, so it, it, that, that's the hard, if I want to know really the hardest thing for us is writing a set list, you know, that, that's very hard. So. I, actually, kind of, kind of going off that, have you guys perfected any songs that you two doesn't really play live? Mm. And which ones? A Celebration. Oh. Wow. Shake! Shake! <laughs> We, we get off on doing stuff they've never done live. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a hardcore fan, so I go way back. But yeah, like, things like a celebration. You want to do that? Yes, please. <laughs> Two seconds of it, because I just love a celebration. Right? Came after the Boy album, right between Boy and October, right? I love that stuff. I love that stuff. I love that stuff. I have to go back to my room and learn it. You're going to rush up on that with it. What about the Swedish thing? Did they do that? Did, did they do Swedish thing live? Because we, we always include it. They don't have one. It's hard to know because we, we go back in time and we've got all these YouTube now and we've got so many live concerts and bootlegs to listen to. Red Hill. Yeah. Wait, did I say Bad was the hardest song to sing? <laughs> that is the hardest song to sing, which is Chris, we don't do that song. <laughs> which is why. Oh my god. That's crazy high. What about, um, how about Acrobat? You guys play Acrobat? Ooh. We do acrobat. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> First verse? Where do we start that? <laughs> we get to appreciate what Mick's doing here. This is amazing. Oh, believe me, we do. We do. It took him 30 years to get all this stuff together. Are you doing acrobat? Okay, hold on. Change your mind. Let's go back. Let's go back. Too late! 
Tony, do you um, do you ever make up lyrics like Bono if you forget them? <laughs> it's not really, but what we do, like what we try to do, is we we also throw snippets in of other other people. For instance, here's a great example, and I I came up with this. <laughs> play play bad, play bad. Well, if you listen to the so song by Filter, it's called Take a Picture. I'm like, that's bad. That's good, but it's bad. <laughs> so we'll, so we'll, be, we'll be doing this. We break the song. song. We go my airplane. We go my airplane. My skin is bad. My skin is bad. We go my airplane. We go my airplane. My skin is bad. My skin is bad. Stuff like, that. stuff like that. Same song, right? Yeah. I think they ripped you two off. I don't know. <laughs> kind of, kind of uh, going off that. Do you guys have your own material? If so, are there you two influences in your own stuff? Craig wrote about 150 songs, <laughs> but there's one song that we recorded. Uh, we did have one original, <laughs> and two weeks ago, and and. Uh, in Sonoma, we actually filmed a video <laughs> of that song. The only bad thing was I was wearing my shoes and it looks like Bono singing the <laughs> Craig Hill song. So that's in the trash. <laughs> it was way for the wine, though. So uh, we, do, we don't, to answer your que question, Chris, we, we, don't, we don't write, we have a couple of songs, but I wish we did write more. You know, he lives in Massachusetts, I live in New Jersey, he lives in New York. We don't even rehearse. We never rehearse. It's like, so. You two's got too many songs. We can't squeeze them in, you know? Okay. Um, let's see here. Stack of questions. Hey, Mick. So Bono says, has said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sitting down. So Bono said a million times that he puts um, Edge's guitar on and puts his fingers in the same place and does everything Edge does and doesn't make the sound. So how did you... I feel the same way, really. I mean, I'm always, I'm always tweaking. We play a gig. I'll write notes down. I'll record it. I'll, I'll listen back, you know, and something don't seem right. So I'll, I'll go home and I'll mess around. I'm never, never content. So, you know, I'm always trying to go a little further, a little further, and uh, never, never satisfied. So. And one more, when you look at uh, Edge's rack, right. like how much, how much envy do you have of that? I have pretty much that whole rack at home. Nice. I, I do. Oh, 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 take that in. Oh, 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 Bam. The only thing I don't have, I don't have a palace. So the, the, the color of the rack. Um, <laughs> have you guys ever met the band? And if so, have they have they commented on? Have they heard you play them? Uh, I've met Bono like three times, but they don't know about us. We did play in front of Paul McGinnis. That was nerve-wracking. <laughs> I mean, imagine you're, it was it was weird. It wasn't like planned. What happened was we were doing this private party uh, in New York City at the New York Athletic Club or something like that, and we, and it's this Irish group, a bunch of Irish folk, and we look out and there's Paul McGinnis. Oh. <laughs> and my heart just dropped. <laughs> I'm like, man, you gotta get me a drink now. <laughs> that was really, that was really nerve-wracking. And, and the great thing about him was, and this is the kind of guy he is, you know, he wasn't listening to us. He was talking to his, his colleagues. He might glance over, but he was the coolest guy because when we were done, we were like, we walk up to him and he goes, I know what you want. <laughs> we're in the photograph. 
He's like, come on. So we took a picture with him, and he was the kindest guy. I mean, I'm not just saying that. He was so nice. So that was the one time we played in front of, we haven't played in front of the guys, but Paul. Okay. Um, something a little more general. Um, how did you guys come together as a tribute band? And then I'm going to add my own um, flavor to that. that Are you guys in? Right? <laughs> yeah, our documentary is being shown, so. Yeah. Michelle and Regina. Are you guys nervous or intimidated by playing this stuff? Have you ever been? Are you? Big time. I mean, how do you? We feel like four jerks up here because you know, you're not you too, and yeah. it's very awkward. Yeah. You know, we're, we're f you know, I can't stress that enough. We're, I'm a fan first and foremost. This is just a hobby. I have a regular job. I have four kids. When I get home after a gig, my mom's, you know, my mom, my wife will say, <laughs> <laughs> "Sorry, no." Uh, Swear to God, swear to God. <laughs> My wife would tell me to go out and mow the lawn, you know. I'm like, hey, I, I can't mow the lawn. I'm the edge, you know. So <laughs> it's all just good fun, you know. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. So I think I'll, I'll open up the floor for a few minutes for questions that, that we didn't get via index card. Does anybody have questions? Yep. Yeah. 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 That's a good one. I like that one. That's a great sound. Yeah, all, all it is is called a whammy, and it uh, more or less uh, just sweeps the tone of the guitar. So if, if you play a note, then I can make you go octaves. That's all, that's all it is. So it's just a. And he also uses that same sound, and uh, it's the same thing. So. That's that's all it is. It's a whammy pedal. That's great. Uh, Edge has always used a a vox with a microphone with it. I can't see where you oh. are. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Uh, I was just you know so in my own little I mean I have very little money to allocate towards this. You know I got a a small DD5 delay and yep. a vox and you know and everything but can you explain the importance of that of why he has used that amplifier and well you know everybody keeps saying that you know and if you look he actually uses five six amps on stage uh, but yeah his anthem songs are all written on the vox that was his first he there's all different types of vox models I don't I don't want to get too crazy with it but he uses what's called a JMI uh, it's the first uh, vox uh, issued which they don't make anymore and each line of Vox amps all sound different. The present day Vox amps that are made in China, I'm not a fan of. Um, my, my Vox is the same one Edge has, same components. I had it all rebuilt. Um, but all the anthem sounds are written on his Vox. Since then, though, there's, he uses Fender amps, Fender Harvard, Fender Blues Jr. Uh, and depending on what song they're playing, for example, Bullet, is, Bullet Blue Sky is not a Vox amp. Bullet, Bullet Blue Sky is a Fender amp. So. He uses amps just as he would effects. If he wants to call up a, for a certain song, he can turn off an amp and turn another amp on, or he can use amps together. But the Vox amp is the same amp he used from day one, and he still uses it today. No, the, 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 the amp itself is just the foundation of the sound. All the echo and stuff is everything in front of it, all that big rack with all the lights on, all the, the effects. So, But his bass sound is just simply... It's like a Beatles sound, the Beatles. It's a simple guitar, British sound, and that's, that's what the Vox gives. Each amp will give a different, you know, if you play like a Marshall, like a Plexi or something like that, you can play Ozzy, you know? So um, it's just a, a flavor. It's his flavor or bass that, that he builds on, and he always goes back to it, and uh, there you go. So that's so what I do. We, got, we, got, we have time for one more, I think, and then we got to wrap up. So, so uh, three things. <laughs> Tonight's concert is a benefit for African Well. You're not going to play in front of more devoted U2 fans than this. It's Saturday night. Play for three hours. <laughs> Rest up. If, if they allow us, we'll play for four. If they allow us. All right, guys. Well, um, we are out of time for the session. Please join me in thanking Unforgettable Fire. Just play real quick. Street.